All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to call the order, call to order the uh, February 11th meeting of the Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District Board of Directors. Let's start by asking Director Orzali to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Director. The uh, Metro Cable announcement, the open session meeting, is videotaped for Cablecast on Metro Cable 14. Replay is on Sunday, February 14th, 2016 at 12 noon, and Monday, February 15th, 2016 at 6 p.m. on Channel 14. It's webcast at dub.sacmetrocable.tv. The open session meetings are also available for viewing on the district website at dub.metrofire.ca.gov. Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers this evening? There are no public speakers. All right, thank you, then we'll move ahead. Uh, I should mention that uh, item two on the closed session agenda has been pulled for tonight, thank you. Uh, directors, any questions on the con consent agenda? Mr. Chair, I make a motion we adopt. I'll second. Thank you very much. Board <coughs> clerk, please call for the question. Director Mitchell? Aye. Gould? Aye. Orzali? Abstain. Wood? Aye. Barnes? Aye. Jones? Aye. And Scheidegger? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Next, we have a presentation item. Chief Wells, please. Well, good evening, directors, um, members of the uh, public and staff. Uh, Mark Wells, Metro Fire, Fire Chief. Um, may I have tonight Mr. Corey Walker and Mr. Larry Roberts. Could you come up and join me up here? I'd like to really recognize tonight um, what it means to be a true member, a true hero in society. And I, I know that um, the hero, the definition of a hero is really one that is people that come out of their normal uh, situation and they step out and they do something extraordinary in a moment in time. So I'd like to honor these two gentlemen, but I'd like to first um, read a narrative from an engine captain from engine 359, Captain Mike Deutsch. On September 1st, 2015, Metro Fire Engine 359 and Medic 59 responded to a report of a vehicle accident and fire. The crews arrived to find two vehicles fully involved in fire, as well as a small grass fire as a result of the vehicle accident. Three individuals were on the side of the highway, one adult female that had self-extricated, and her two children, ages six and nine. It was reported to Captain Deutsch that two individuals passing by the accident had seen the accident occur and immediately stopped to help. These two individuals, Mr. Corey Walker, Mr. Larry Roberts, pulled the two children from one of the vehicles as both vehicles were beginning to ignite. Captain Deutsch, who made the nomination, said that he believes that if these brave individuals had not rescued these two children, they may have perished. Therefore, we believe the heroic actions of these individuals contributed to the saving of these two children, and tonight we would like to recognize them publicly. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for your service and um, doing something that was, I'm sure you would do it again, but I would say that a lot of people would just drive by. So thank you. And the lives of these two young children, who knows, maybe they'll cure cancer. <laughs> and uh, seriously, you have no idea the potential that's in this world today. So thank you very much. So first, I'd like to um, provide this to Mr. Larry Roberts. Still here. 
and Mr. Corey Walker. Would either of you like to say anything? I hate to put you on the spot. <laughs> I just said it once before and I'll say it again. Um, I don't think anything in this world happens by mistake. It's all in God's timing and he had us where he needed us that night so that we were able to do what we needed to do. And uh, that's a blessing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'd like to say the, the true hero here is this man right here. I look up to him. He is my mentor, and he <laughs> took action. I just followed his lead. <laughs> Thank we you. appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. That's great. And actually, I'd like to, to the family members get the pictures they wanted because quite – yeah, please come on up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have family there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to introduce Great. Please do. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to get used to these photo sessions, I think. <laughs> Everyday heroes, members of the public. Thank you very much, Chief, and thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. All right, with that, um, I would like to now open a public hearing uh, for the appeal by Mr. Alan Davis regarding the building code enforcement at the property located at 6241 Fair Oaks Boulevard in Carmichael. I'd like to just clarify a couple of things. Um, the order of the presentation uh, for this hearing will be district staff first, and then the appellant and whoever he brings with him. Um, the information will be for the benefit of both parties. Uh, the presentation is informal. Uh, we're not gonna be sticking to legal procedure or evidentiary rules. Um, and basically, with that, what I'm going to do is ask members of SAC Metro staff relevant members to please come forward. Good evening, board president, board evening. members, fire chief, members of the public and Metro Fire staff. My name is Greg Castantini, Assistant Chief for Metro Fire, Fire Marshal for the CRRD Division. Metro Fire received an appeal request to have a board hearing regarding a commercial property located at 6241 Fair Oaks Boulevard in District 5, known as the Milagro Center. The property is intended to include multiple restaurants and should be a focal point and great addition to the community. The topic of discussion and reason for the hearing tonight is a 40-foot security gate across an interior courtyard, which is also the front, main access and egress of the structure. What I'm going to talk about tonight is some background on the project, some basic definitions that we'll need to interpret some of the code, a description of the issue, some steps taken to come to a resolution, and also the CRRD position and recommendation to the board this evening. I'd like to also introduce Supervising Inspector Lisa Barsdale, sitting in the number two chair. 
She is the expert when it comes to CRRD's fire code interpretation. So if we have any further questions, she'll be Metro Fire's representation for that as well. So some background on this project. The building was constructed over 60 years ago and has been altered many times over the years. The estimated square footage for the building is around 36,800 square feet, the very large building. The square footage of the courtyard that's in question is around 3,600 square feet. Now before you on your screens and up on the monitor, we're looking at the center courtyard areas where we're talking about. And on the lower portion, there's a 40 foot gate across the main access and egress. There's an arrow pointing to it where it shows exit right there on that picture. <coughs> so in December of 2013, Metro Fire received plans for a retail space, tenant improvement for the building and Metro CRRD division reviewed the plans. Now the key here is that it was a retail space initially when we received the plans. A shell only permit was issued on January 27, 2014. Now this permit allows contractors to modify an existing building, creating tentative space without a certificate of occupancy being granted so the space is more marketable for future tenants. The building is designed with the center court gathering area, which also appears to be the main entrance and exit for customers. The 40 foot main entrance opening has an installed rolling vertical security grate. It's currently installed. So some basic definitions that we need to know regarding the fire code. An assembly occupancy, that's what we're gonna to refer to many times is an occupancy with more than 50 persons that's used for gathering for civic use, religious use, social, recreation, food or drink consumption. That's an assembly. A mercantile occupancy refers to an occupancy that includes the use of a building for the display and sale of merchandise, usually referred to retail. So let's describe the issue. The shell only permit was granted with the security grate being approved <coughs> as the building was classified as a retail occupancy, or an M, which is known as mercantile, per the building code. That was pretty clear upon the initial submission. Now to date, the district has received three sets of tenant improvement plans, and the building occupancy classification has changed to include multiple restaurants in the building, which changes the classification to an assembly because the occupancy load and potential life safety hazard has also increased. So we went from an M, which is retail, to an A, which is assembly. Now under the increased classification and occupant load from retail to assembly, the security grade is no longer per permitted by up to four, four codes, including the building code and fire code. For the design occupant load from the plans, the center courtyard area requires three exits with panic hardware, excluding the gate. Okay, the 40 foot gate does not account for the fire code. Currently, there is only one exit out of the rear with panic hardware that meets part of that code. So on February 10th, the architects, <coughs> county building officials, and Metro Fire staff all agreed that the center courtyard area is an A occupancy based on the intended use of the center courtyard area. I'm gonna now switch pictures. This was provided. So before you, and on the screen, you'll see the intended use photographs that were handed to us. This is the intended use for the center courtyard area. Now the building officials, the two architects in the room, and the Metro Fire all agreed that this is clearly an, an assembly use of the occupancy. I won't go into the four different codes that refers to this. They're, they're in the packet as well. Um, except for one. California Fire Code 1001.2. It is unlawful to alter a building or structure in a manner that will reduce the number of exits or the capacity of the means of egress to less than required by this code. Now Metro Fire adopted the 2013 building code and the fire code. The fire code is pretty clear. You need three exits for the intended occupancy load in this center courtyard area. The board, Metro Fire, we can't even legally 
change the minimum requirements that is required by the law. So let's cover the steps that we've taken to come to a resolution here. We have had two office hearings with the building representatives over the last month, one being a couple days ago. And in, in that attendance was the two architects on record, the building representatives and county building officials. We've given suggestions several times to modify the grate, to remove the grate, or add additional exits. Metro Fire and the County Building Department has agreed to permit several restaurants to occupy their spaces prior to the full sign off of the building so we can get them in, get their business rolling because they meet the minimum exit requirements per their restaurants. They don't need that center courtyard. So we wanna encourage business, get these businesses open as quick as possible. So we agreed with county to let the restaurants start to occupy here fairly soon. And final, the recommendation to the board of directors. Life safety is a function of time. Time for detection, time for notification, time for response, and time for safe egress. All the fire codes and the majority of the building codes have been written due to loss of life and tragedy. Safe and standard exiting is imperative to our citizens and our first responders. Besides fire issues, there are other emergencies that the building needs to be design, designed safely for, such as an active shooter, which happens, and also like an earthquake. In conclusion, by law, Metro Fire has to enforce the minimum standards, and our staff recommend that the board deny the appeal and encourage the building representatives to continue to work with our staff to come to a compliant solution. Thank you very much. That's the end of the presentation. If you have any questions now, or we can take them when, when you're ready. Thank you very much. Uh, members of the board, do you have any questions yeah. for the fire marshal? You, you want to wait till later? Yeah. Nothing now. Okay. Thank you very much, fire yes, marshal. Sir. Appreciate Thank your you. presentation. Mr. Davis, yes. would you please come forward? And sure. anyone you'd like to have join you, please? Yes, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, I'm Alan Davis, uh, the developer of Milagro Center. Uh, my wife and I started this project about three years ago. Um, unfortunately, she passed away last year, and I'm trying to carry forth our dream of creating a gathering space in Carmichael. There's nothing in existence there, and we wanted to do that for the people of the area. Um, the architects that I hired at the time uh, assured me that this was uh, OK to do this project with the gathering space in the middle of the center where people could go in and out with their food or drink and relax and sit on their computer and, and um, just visit. And we thought this was fine and we installed this security gate that would come down after hours when the building's completely empty it'd be the last thing to come down no one would be allowed in the building after the gate comes down period so um, we had the approval to do that and installed it at considerable cost it was about thirty thousand dollars and um then when the inspector came out, uh, she saw the gate and said, we can't have that. So uh, it was quite a surprise uh, to me. And it would only be down when the building isn't occupied. So I was uh, quite surprised to hear uh, that determination. So I don't have all the details and the specifics of the uh, loads uh, of people congregating and what's necessary for exiting and all that. But I do know that if that gate's up during business hours, people can easily go in and out rather than create exiting uh, barriers there instead. So I'll let... Uh, Rich, do you want to say a few things? Sure. Okay. Rich is our uh, property manager. 
Rich McCutton. Good evening. Um, dealing with that space by Please itself. Please introduce yourself, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Rich McCutton with Milagro Properties. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, the, the A designation, I don't think there's any discussion that, that it's going to be kicked in uh, based on the tables and chairs. It's no, no disagreement at all. But when you look at that space with that door up, and it can be locked in an open position so it couldn't possibly come down, and, it, and the converse of that is also true, that it, it, there are devices that, would, in, the case, in the event of a fire, would automatically open the gate. So that we don't see that as an issue. In fact, we, we think we've supplied more space for them to be able to exit than they'd get by code if we put a typical retail storefront there with the required number of doors. So we see that as one huge door, probably in 40 feet, uh, six doors. So I don't think egress is really an issue. Um, but safety certainly is. There's a very low fire load in that space as well. It's a concrete floor, concrete wall. Uh, steel and glass, and a plastic ceiling. There's 38 sprinklers in the space, um, and I think that, that that should be part of the consideration as to that being a safe, you know, uh, uh, under any circumstances or any conditions. I think the real key for us is that it's only going to be down when the place is empty, so there's a zero load, and if somebody was left behind unintentionally or somebody broke in and was in the space, there is a, 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 an exit door with panic hardware already there. Joe, would you like to add anything? Thank you. Good evening, board members. My name is Joseph Covington. I'm an architect, uh, an AIA member. And I recently moved up here about a year ago. Um, and Alan has uh, gainfully employed me to try and help steer some of his projects. And this is one of them. Uh, I am not the architect of record of the Shell building nor any of the TIs. I'm trying to help Alan work through this, this dilemma. Um, so I, I tried to give as much of my knowledge and expertise as possible. I've been practicing since 86. Been, well, I've been practicing in architecture since I graduated in 77 and uh, licensed in 86. Um, I've seen codes come and go. Um, and I've seen a lot of changes. They've, they've basically, um, you know, as things occur, and unfortunately, due to tragedies, sometimes they cause changes. Um, I have sort of a, a sense that I, I really can't stay on track sometimes, so I'm going to kind of read something, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, hopefully, you'll get bored, but I'll try and get through this as quick as possible. Um, yeah, with respect to all the all the uh, fire marshals and the people that actually help in our uh, health safety and welfare uh, endeavors, uh, we really appreciate everything everybody does. We don't want to jeopardize anybody's life or, or safety. Um, the 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 city building and the fire marshals have often helped architects find their way through dilemmas when they get into doing plans, and it's helped us out a lot to, to work out things. And so hopefully we can work together to come to a, a, an agreeable solution. <clears throat> Building and associated codes have processed and developed to outline standards required to guide our assembly of materials that create spaces we inhabit. They've grown from small manuals of to volumes of text, right now there are 12 volumes, physically large binders, that outline all the different disciplines, not to mention the additional supplements associated with them. It provides, it proves that we change philosophies, providing growth and safety issues to develop guidelines. So in other words, this growth of these manuals has occurred mostly to help protect the general public. Sometimes they have to grow from tragedies, which is what we really want to try and prevent. Some of the past uh, improvements have always helped us realize that um, 
there are many examples of things that have gone wrong that we need to correct. Some of them have been as simple as, as padlocks on, on panic hardware doors and uh, you know chains and that sort of thing to interior bridges where people get up and they start dancing on them and they actually collapse because they've been overloaded, but they were never intended for that. We've actually come to the point where you know, we need to look at things and, and understand it, but we can't prevent all the tragedies. You know, looking at the, at the World Trade Center uh, was designed to actually take the impact of a small plane, not the large plane that went into it. So, I mean, we, we try to develop the codes and do the things that we think are best, and there's a lot of things that, that occur that we can't foresee. <clears throat> The best a code can do is to outline structured requirements to be followed as interpreted for each instance when presented on paper before construction. The code as a guideline can require exact and precise, even calculated documentation to follow the intent of regulations listed. Not all the instances are apparent and may need explanation for their design elements integrated into a structure. So we've got things that we really need to, to adhere to, but then we always got the, the, the obvious uh, thing that we can't, can't really judge or dictate, and that's human behavior. Um, it cannot be predicted. We gather and converse in hallways, stairways, sidewalks, wherever an instantaneous meeting may occur. I know you've often run into a bunch of people in a, in a small space, and, and you kind of have to negotiate your way, negotiate your way through it. Um, these spaces were never intended to be gathering spaces. Nobody designated them a, you know, uh, assembly occupancies. They are places where things occur. So we have to just kind of understand that, you know, there are instances and in, in spaces and things that you can't dictate by the code. <clears throat> No spaces are given the best estimate. So, so spaces are given the best estimate used as outlined by the codes and they, need, they classify their needs. As stated before, the codes change and previous codes and dining establishments were once considered the same occupancies as um, businesses, but they've changed and now they've become a occupancies. So, I mean, we've seen changes in the codes. Does that mean that it can be prohibited for every instance? <clears throat> Let me roll on here. I better keep going. Um, fire sprinklers, evacuation alarm systems, emergency lighting, exit exiting stipulations, reasoning for occupancy during initial review of plans, allow the rolled up uh, grill, which has been discussed. An exception of roll up grills included in some occupancies like businesses, which dining used to be classified, which I explained, do not include the revised classification required for, court, for this courtyard under consideration. And I think that's kind of why we need to look at this in a little different um, attitude is because it is a different instance than your, your generic assembly area. Given the documented problematic nature of local uh, people that are in this area um, during after hours, there's been a need for some security, which was thought of and why this, this grill was, was put in. And... Um, Subsequent changes in the initial tenant improvements, which we've discussed, you know, have altered the interpretations, not really altered the interpretations, but have required the interpretations of the code uh, to change. And we, we understand that change, but we still need to protect the property. Um, Milagro's, you know, a, a very um, sort of gem developed in this area, and I think we'd like to keep it as clean and as, as healthy as possible. 
The owner feels compelled to request a consideration to keep the grill already constructed in place. Like a mercantile or business established, a grill of this type is allowed as long as it is kept in the open position while it is occupied. With the space in question equipped with fire sprinklers, emergency lighting, emergency security, uh, emergency evacuation alarm systems, and observation after hours with security cameras and alarm system, we feel the grill can be maintained and close, closed only after the final occupant is left. There is an emergency exit door at the rear, that's been explained in the, on the west side. And um, I think that, that that would allow any incidental person that happened to go in there for, that wasn't supposed to be there to be able to get out if there were an emergency. It would not be an A occupancy, obviously, because you're not loading it with a full uh, load of people. So that's where uh, the owner uh, feels that this is justified, that there just will not be people in this area after lockdown. But if they were, there is still a way out. We'll continue to work with Metro Fire and the building department to assure all tenant development within the shell meet all safety issues. It's not the owner's intent to jeopardize any person's safety for any reason, only to review the practicality of the courtyard space use compared with the intent of the code requirements. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any Mr. Davis? Questions? Well, I was just going to ask that. Board members, sure. any questions? Yes, Director Gould. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for coming here this evening. I have a question for our staff as well. Um, it sounds to me like this area is an open area, at least on the east side, that they're behind this grill or gate. There are no doors or it's an open area. Is that true? Uh, yes. Oh, okay. okay, and so, you know, I guess I'm envisioning when you go into Brooklyn or something and, and it's past 1130, everybody has a grill that comes down, even on K Street, there's a grill that comes down and closes off the occupancy of that, you know, so I, I see that as a security issue more than anything. And so, and, and so I see this as a big open area. Okay, and then my next question is, is, is it in fact true that these roll downs have the opportunity to be rolled up quickly in some kind of a panic mode if it's triggered by all the electronics we require small businesses to have today, that if the sprinklers activated, somebody hit a big red panic button, that that thing would immediately roll up if it was down for a security component. Um, because to me, it seems like what the, the, I get all the intent differences. They changed. I think they would freely admit that they went from maybe retail ideas to now it's a, it's a restaurant. I think businesses have to do that to stay alive. But they did it for a security. And if you know anything about the area, I think he was very politically correct in, in describing the area. But they're doing it to protect future occupants from the millions of dollars they no doubt are going to invest in these nice restaurants there. That if, in fact, it's capable of rolling up when occupancy begins, rolling down when it ends, and there being some kind of panic structure that allows that to go right back up very quickly to allow egress as it would occur. To me, I just don't see why that would be a big problem for us because what we're looking for is the ability to get people out very quickly so they don't stack up behind a chain door and burn to death. Is And, and I'm looking at this space and thinking a lot of heat and a lot of everything else is going to go other places, but as long as that door, if you were able to put some electronic there that, that immediately activated, and, it, and again, that would be in, from what I'm hearing testimony is, that would only occur after hours, if someone was stuck in there or they were mistakenly put in the build or in the building when the, the thing came down, and then by luck, have you know a fire or something else happened. So I'm just trying to see. We don't require that. I don't think of other small businesses that have put it in. No, maybe what they did is they put it in after they got their approval, and the security system came in, didn't pull a permit, and got it in there. So every night they just close it down and go home happy as clams. What's happened is in your efforts to secure your facility, you did it before the occupancy permits were all completed, where maybe you take it off, 
get your occupancy, and then we do something different. I'm just trying to figure out a, a, a middle ground here because this is a critical, as the chief has already talked about, this is a critical piece of the puzzle in Carmichael. I don't even represent them, but I know being, uh, you know, uh, living in that area, this needs to be developed. It needs to have what this owner has described as, as good places for us to gather in that area. So I'm supportive. Chief, did you, do you, either of you in, from Metro, do you know of systems that would allow that gate to retract in a life safety kind of situation? Hi, Lisa, I'm Lisa Barsdale with Metro Fire. Um, I don't know of any that will allow it to retract. Typically, if we have electronic devices, it's to close doors or seal openings, not to retract and pull them back up. Um, because the fail safe on that is if the power goes out, those doors and um, roll downs would automatically deploy closed, not back up and open. That sounds like a polarity issue with an engine, okay. <laughs> Well, if, if they were able to provide you some evidence that there is something like that we out could, there. Yeah, we'd be more than willing to consider that um, as long as it would activate an emergency. Yeah, and it sounded like from the testimony there's apparently somewhere that's available. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Thank Chief. Thank you. Director Barnes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The questions I have, and I appreciate the presentations from both sides. Uh, my honest opinion about this, especially in Sacramento region, is businesses, people have the right to thrive. Okay, in our community. That is something I've been past it a few times. I'm glad to see that happening. However, I also live in a world of it's predict or predictable, it's preventable. Um, and an active shooter or something that we cannot predict. We live in a world now of matter of when, not if things like that are gonna happen. My concern is, and it sounds like you're collaborating together and I would encourage you to continue to do that. If someone walks into the east side of that gate during a very high volume night full of people sitting around enjoying, which we want them to do, and start doing bad things. The only exit route is that one door on the west side. Okay, is that, no, is that not true? That's what I'm asking, is that not true? Because to me it looks like it turns into a funnel of, of a bunch there, of people trying people to get out there. people present and there's any load at all, the door is up and can be locked up. Correct, but if I'm, let's say, for sake of conversation, uh, I'm a person with ill intentions and I'm coming in that open door with a firearm and everybody's sitting in that open courtyard, their main exit route would be through that one door to the west. Is oh, that there's, no. there's, here's the, I don't know. No, we, ha we have a small schematic yeah, of that. But we have it. all these doors going. It, yeah, but that goes back into a restaurant with them having to search for an exit inside that restaurant. An open retail space. Correct. correct. Well, excuse me, open retail space. But at, they're left at their own devices to seek cover, try and get an escape route. And here's, here's what I'm getting at, and I don't want to belabor the issue, is I like the idea it has an open door because I think that draws people in. It's an open community-type environment. However, we need to provide safety because it's a matter of when, not if these things happen. And to say a gate closes, I think that's great for security to secure those businesses. But when it's open and it's a very booming night full of patrons and they're sitting on those couches, if that's the intended, enjoying their evening, and someone comes in to do harm, we're not talking just fire, we're talking safety. But I think you also have to consider, you, you wouldn't expect somebody to run towards the fire, but if they did have to get out of there quickly with that door up, it's a much bigger opening for them to scramble through than a pedestrian door. No, correct, but I, I'm talking further than just fire. I, and, and that's what I'm talking about, the safety of people with ill intentions. I pray that never happens, but it does. I mean, we have evidence of it all over the place. There's also exit out the back. That east, that west door, that one door that we've already identified. <laughs> As you continue to build, that's what I'm saying, and I'm not looking to add money to the development or architect, art, architectural design to take away from the, the visual concept, but we can't, in good conscience, in my mind, go forward with something that in a mass casualty incident, if someone goes in the front with ill intentions, everybody's sitting there, they're stuck in what we call a fatal funnel. Can I, excuse me, can I ask you, if we were to close off the front and put two exit doors there instead to meet the code requirement, that would be more confining than just having it up. But there also could be an additional door because I think we're requiring four if I'm correct. Is three, that right? I believe. Three, three? Okay. Yeah. And, and I, I know logistically, I'm sorry. Well, ahead, we sir. could put three in the front, but it's still going to restrict it more than just having it up all the way. What about the two exits in the back? And again, I'm not an architect, nor, and please don't take it as such. I'm just thinking, as you work together, and it sounds like you're sitting together working together, <clears throat> I don't want this to stop if 
if my position is let's continue to work towards better exit routes because that's that's what I want. And that's my position only. I have to be candid with that. How do you get better than an open space? Yeah. What what is your default if you're and, and again I, I don't if you're if you're inside there and your only default is that one exit door to run from a, a, a mass casualty type incident, not a fire, with alarms and sprinklers going on. What, what is your, you go into businesses and then? Side doors to scramble out of. And if we built it to code and put a standard retail storefront there and, and put two more doors in the front or three more doors in the front, it, you, it's still more constricting than if that space was wide open. Okay. Right. And that's why I wanted to make the point as far as I see a, a potential issue of everybody clogged in the middle there. And if someone comes in that big door, because that's the inviting door for someone who does has ill intentions, not the back door to sneak in. Well, we kind of, you know, I've heard categorization tonight that that is the main entrance to the whole place, and it's actually not. Okay. Every restaurant and every retailer has their own door and their own sign across the front of the building. So if you're going there to go to River City Brewing, you're not going to walk into the, walk into the middle and then through all the space. To okay, get and that's door. something I was not aware of, so that's good to know as well. A perimeter exits all around the building. Okay, very good. Thank you. Any other comments to that question? Okay, any other I'm board sorry. members? Any other questions? Director, Director Rosella. Rosella. I'm sorry, um, I know we've been discussing the roll down gate being only down during business hours, um, which would be allowed. Up uh, during business hours? Uh, I mean, yes. That's sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, the code allows for that in retail spaces because the use in the um, population in the general areas is a lot significantly less than it would be in an assembly. In assemblies, it doesn't allow for doors to have locks or latches other than panic type hardware, not even after hours. So that's, you know, that's the information that we're providing to the architects and to you is the code doesn't give us that ability in assembly uses to have those doors or that roll down grate locked even after business hours. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Director Orzelli. Um Question. When it says, if the, if the grate weren't in place, it didn't exist, would there be an issue? There would, there would be no issue at that point, except for the security of the building. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. There's something I'd like to reinforce here is we need to des design the safety features for this building for years to come. Businesses come and go. Different types of occupancies come and go in this. And if I was a bad guy, what I would do is disable that door so it locks down mm -hmm. and I'll have over 500 people in that area to do what I want with. Because you got to remember, when you go into a building, what do you do? You go in one way and you go out the same way usually. Whoever looks for a secondary exit, who in this building came into this room and found a secondary exit other than this back door that we came in? You know, people are creatures of habit. And that's what I would do if I was a bad guy. I would lower that grate and go to work on 500 plus people, and that's what the design use for this occupancy is 500 plus people. Thank you. Um, just to follow on with that, is this board being asked, this is being presented to us, what's the limits of what we can do here? Do we have the capacity to grant a waiver? Is that what's being asked? It is against the fire code, which basically means it's against the law. The board's hands are basically tied in this. The one thing that you cannot alter is exiting requirements. We can give allowances for hydrant spacing, for types of road use, and some other variances, which we regularly do to keep businesses going. But the one thing you cannot do is change the exiting requirements. It's against the fire code, which means it's against the law. I say something. I don't believe it says in the code that I can't have that. Uh, security gate. It only stipulates that other uses can have it. Mm, right. If I'm it, correct. Fire Marshal, can we get that clarified? Can, can you provide us the, the specific code sections? Not necessarily right now, but between now and the, and the next meeting? Well, I have it right now, Director. Oh, great. That's even better. It's part of my presentation. Code 1008.14.4 under security grills. In groups B, which is business, F, M, which is mercantile, S, which is storage, 
horizontal sliding or vertical security grills are permitted at the main exit and shall be openable from the inside without the use of key or special knowledge or effort during periods that the space is occupied. That's four different classifications, none of which are the highest rating which are assembly. It's, it's allowed at four. The code does not say that it's not allowed in A. It only permits four uses for that. Does that answer your question, Director? I, yes, it does, I think. Thank Director you. Director Rosali, are you? Well, uh, one other, um, I, I heard the issue of uh, a reference to interpretation and, um, and looking for some reasonable way for this goal to be accomplished. Uh, does that, in, in your view, does that simply not exist? that there's no reasonable way to accomplish this? The only reasonable suggestion that we've come up with is to install two doors underneath the grate on the other sides that are permanent and stationary with panic hardware where the grate would come down in between that and on top of the doors. Mm -hmm. Now, ironically enough, this morning, the architect sent over drawings for that exact design. We have those inside to cal calculate the occupant load and that is really their next step. They sent it to us this morning. They said it's not an official presentation, but I believe that's gonna be their next step is to have the two doors on the front. That's the, really the only thing that we came up with besides removal of the gate. And this is a normative, within the, the boundaries of, let's say, uh, Metro Fire, would you say this is universally applied? As far as the rolling, the rolling gate or the... It, this, situations like this. That's right. You know, the, the fire code does not give us the allowance to make any modifications regarding exiting requirements for assemblies. Mm -hmm. Like I said a few minutes ago, other things we can give some allowances for, we absolutely cannot do this one. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Director. we've had experiences years ago where an, a new owner came in and had changed the outline of what was the racquetball court and wanted it different, but it was now a large assembly hall and wanted to change exiting. So yes. When there's precedence from this board that we would not allow the right. assembly to be changed, we've changed others, but when it got to an assembly, we did not allow that to happen because of, of the code, which doesn't sound like it's changed much. Yeah, that's correct. You know, last year there was a church group that had leased mm -hmm. a, an old bank on this uh, Mather property moved in, it was found with the building codes that you can't have a church assembly group in a business which is a bank. They had to move out, now they're going through some work to get fire exiting and sprinklers, you have to upgrade to the A occupancy. So we are uh, very consistent in this interpretation. Director Jones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, what, uh, oh, the occupancy load for the assembly area designated as a courtyard is 514 people. Is that correct? You know, uh, Director. OC? Yeah, we are still waiting on the final occupancy loads for the different section. We have some of them. Mm -hmm. It could be possible that if this entire building was at full capacity, you could have upwards of 1,000 people. Those are big okay. numbers. Those are big numbers. Remember, an assembly is anything over 50 people. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Now, and then, uh, per the code, what, how many inches of exit way do we need to accommodate uh, egress out of this area? It's probably two double-type doors at for least. For the space, it's actually th specifically three exits required, and those three exits would accommodate their exit width. They're not usually when you get a higher occupant load, maybe more towards a thousand, that will affect the width of your doors. Mm -hmm. But the the area that's in question, the three exits um, at 36 inches would accommodate. Okay, 36, two 36 inch doors. Two and more. a car wear on each side. On the front, and then the one that's on the existing right. on the back. Okay, well, thank you very much. I visited the site and took a look at this. It's a gorgeous. Uh, development. I would look forward to going there so at times for uh, you know social diversion. It'd be great. As I pulled up for the first glance at the visual, the only entrance into this place is through this main open area. It's very inviting. It's very aesthetic. 
there, upon walking, I could see there were single doors on a couple of the far side rooms, okay? As you go in, that's where you go in. That's an invitation. It looks gorgeous. Don't get me wrong, it looks gorgeous. This is a do thing. It can be accomplished. The little section in the back is pretty much worthless. I know technically it's not, but it is because you have a beautiful fireplace with an embankment uh, sitting area and you have to have, it's like two right hand turns very sharp and you're lucky if it's 36 inches wide and you cannot see the exit except for maybe the light. That's the only thing that can designate it on that side. If you try to go to the left, you can't get out because there's some sort of electrical there. And again, what I'm talking about, what I'm going through my mind are, is a high load of hundreds of people, an emergency panic situation, and how folks react. All this, and uh, again, I'm speaking from, uh, did time in the office a couple years in, as an assistant fire marshal for the city of Sacramento. Assemblies are the most critical, the most vulnerable aspects that fire prevention has next to hazardous, um, hazardous occupancies. Assemblies are th about the highest risk that we have to deal with. And for that, uh, not only the, the aesthetics and the common sense business of visiting there and seeing how it would work, plus there is a resolution with only two extra side doors on the side, I feel that this can be accomplished. It will meet code. It will, uh, it will satisfy the letter of the law. It will satisfy the intent of the law. And it will settle the moral obligation of this board. Director, thank you. Any other director's comments? Or Director Mitchell. As I sit here and listen to this tonight, first of all, I would like to say I applaud the owners and the fire districts for working together and have stated you will continue to work together to bring this <clears throat> to, a, to an amicable conclusion. I think that's key in this problem. I too have visited the site, more or less because I would share with you, uh, I served for the Carmichael Fire Protection District years ago, uh, as well as some of the men sitting before you. But I, I think we're in a position here, and I agree with my colleagues, and I would certainly ask our fire marshal, we are in a position of the law saying we cannot alter or we would be in violation of a code. And even though I think that's been made clear here, I would ask our fire marshal to step to the podium again to make that clear again that this board, if I'm understanding you correctly, we cannot by statute alter that in this specific application. But again, in saying that, I applaud you for working with these owners and, and I, from one director and I think all of us, I can't speak for the whole board, but that working together, I think this can come to an amicable conclusion, but, but please, I think it needs to be said again that if I understood you correctly, we cannot alter that law or we would be breaking the law ourselves. Thank you, Director, for the question. Director Jones, you were right when you said the assembly is the most important. That's where most people are going to gather. I do not believe altering this grade, altering the exiting requirements that have been set up through years of law, years of loss of life. We've all seen increased danger to our community. Panic situations seem to be on the rise. People are creatures of habit. This is not a liability that the board wants to incur. We're up to hundreds, if not maybe a thousand people in this building, following their habit skills, entering and exiting under a panic situation. So to reiterate, California Fire Code 1001.2, it is unlawful to alter a building or a structure in a manner that will reduce the number of exits or capacity of the means of egress to less than required by this code. My interpretation of this code as a fire marshal for Metro Fire it is illegal for Metro Fire and the board that sits before us to permit any change in the exiting requirements. Thank you, Thank Fire you. Marshal, for answering my Thank question you. that way. But I would also conclude by saying that I applaud not only uh, our Fire Prevention Bureau, yourself, 
but the, the owners and the people he's brought before us this evening, because I think we have all seen in times like this where agencies haven't worked together. And in this particular case, you are working together. You are both to be applauded, and I'm sure that we will come to a, an applicable conclusion to this. So, gentlemen, uh, from the, the building trades and the building owner, I applaud you with not just walking out on this app. You're working with our people, and I applaud you for that. All right. Thank you. I'd like to reiterate uh, thanking all of the speakers tonight on this uh, very interesting issue. What I'd like to do now is explain a little bit about the process that uh, we are bound to in terms of the uh, rules and regulations of this body. This matter is now submitted and will be on the next Board of Directors agenda as an action item for final decision. That'll be uh, in February 25th. The board will decide based on the evidence and the testimony presented. Basically, I would encourage you to continue to work together. Uh, I appreciate very much both sides being here tonight, and giving us excellent presentations. And I appreciate the fact that I believe you will continue to work together to find a good resolution. With that, this hearing is closed for this point, and we'll talk about it on February, or decide on February 25th. Thank you. All right, we'll now move on to action items. Mr. Newcomer, are you here? I know I've seen you. I mean tonight. I've seen you tonight. <laughs> Please. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you President, Board, Chief. Uh, I'm Jim Newcomer. I'm the vice chair of your deferred comp committee. Um, I've come before you tonight with another vacancy on our committee due to a retirement from within the service. Um, a little bit of background. Uh, the board of directors have approved a plan that provides for the employees to participate in a 457 program, which is a employee funded retirement account. Uh, we have a nine-member committee that serves at your pleasure to manage our account or our fund. We have a third-party administrator and we have a consultant to look after the business that we conduct on behalf of you and the employees of the fire district. Uh, the candidate that we have selected and recommend to you planned on being here with us tonight but his wife and their soon-to-be child have changed his plans for the evening. <laughs> I don't think they're in labor, but it's... Won't be the last. Mitch is not with us tonight. So Mitch Thomas was the uh, unanimous um, suggestion from the committee to the Board of Directors for appointment to replace Tom Sablodnik, who um, left employment here with Metro Fire and um, I think he's in the South Bay now working for someone else. Tom did some great things for us and was a very, very productive member of our committee. Um, we wish him the best. Um, one thing the committee decided on several years ago is uh, we have the ability to have several retired members sit on that committee. Should we choose as a retiree not to resign from the committee, there's no mechanism to kick me out. But we don't want to see the age of our committee be in the rocking chair when we've got young people out on the rank and on the on the line in the rank and file with their investments. So we've made a conscious effort to try to find younger employees that have a desire to participate with us in their deferred comp program. And we've been very fortunate that uh, both our last suggestion and this current one have been just that younger employees that have a desire to to work with the Deferred Comp Committee. Um, with that, uh, Mitch Thomas is a firefighter paramedic with Metro Fire, participating in our Deferred Comp Program, and uh, has attended two of our meetings as a guest, not yet being a member, until you gentlemen make that appointment. Um, and with that being said, the uh, Deferred Comp Committee would um, 
recommend to the board of directors that they adopt the resolution before them to appoint Mitch Thomas to the deferred comp committee. So moved. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, question please. Director Mitchell? Aye. Gould? Aye. Orzali? Aye. Wood? Aye. Barnes? Aye. Jones? Aye. And Scheidegger? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Duke. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's move on to reports. Uh, the President's report. Uh, number one, I would like to encourage all of the directors to follow up with Melissa in terms, if you have not provided uh, information in terms of your availability for a workshop, that's very important. We're trying to schedule that. Also, um, uh, any priorities that you may have that you want to interject it into the forum. And Melissa, I'd like to thank you very much for your fine work in leading this. Uh, second, I wanted to report that um, I was able to attend a mid-year budget review that uh, this uh, department hosted. Um, it was attended by all executive staff. It was attended by uh, representatives of 522. And it's just another example of what an outstanding job the management of this fire department is doing. Uh, people were sitting in an open room discussing their own responsibilities uh, in, in the context of other people's responsibilities. Uh, it was a common goal, it was a common good. Um, and I want to give kudos to Chief Wells for providing that environment and certainly to Ms. Thomas for, for leading a very fine uh, review of, of our fiscal status. I, I think it's an excellent example of how well we're managed. Thank you. All right, next, fire chief reports. Thank you, Director Scheider. Uh, you know, it's uh, with great honor tonight to congratulate um, the following employees that have been selected by their peers for the employee of the year. Uh, we're going to announce their names tonight, and then we are going to be scheduling, um, as we do, a, a, a ceremony in their honor where we can honor them and also the other 17 members that are um, very deserving of nominations. But tonight I'd like to um, specifically acknowledge firefighter paramedic Russ Gardner, who is the suppression recipient, accounting specialist Matt Davies, who is the support recipient, and reserve firefighter Dennis Berry is our reserve volunteer firefighter recipient, um, long-term member of the community in, up in the Rio Linda area. So those three um, outstanding individuals are our, fire, are our employees of the year this year. Uh, and so we're excited about that. So more information forthcoming for a date that'll be determined in terms of uh, formally honoring them. And like I said, there were 17 other um, fine individuals of this organization that were also nominated by their peers. So it's nice to see that we have a lot of people working at high levels at every aspect of this agency. Um, just a quick update on ongoing negotiations continue um, with Local 522. Uh, as uh, Director Scheiger, President Scheidegger just uh, mentioned, the mid-year budget review process, we had our meeting on the 10th. Uh, with all of our budget officers, um, and thank you very much, Director, uh, for your participation. Um, it is actually a very good uh, interactive process for all of us at every level to uh, discuss the budget in a very transparent manner, uh, which I think is the most um, interesting in my experience here that um, you can learn anything you need to know about the budget by coming to the meeting, which is great. Um, that budget will be going to the Finance, finance and Audit Committee on next board meeting in February. It'll be the 25th of February, uh, which is the uh, mid-year budget. And then the full board will be um, brought the mid-year budget on the 10th of March for formal adoption. Um, also today, uh, myself and um, Rusty Dupre, we attended the Metro Chamber State Legislative Summit downtown. Um, very interesting. Um, heard some um, great information and a, a good legislative panel discussion. And then um, uh, Secretary of State um, um, Padilla was actually there, uh, which was great. Good information. Always good to be in the business community um, with the Metro Chamber um, and understanding the different dynamic interests of the um, not only the business community, but a lot of public sector um, entities are involved in that as well. One of the kind of exciting, but maybe a temporary thing, um, we were able to open Engine 106 yesterday. And I know I had a conversation um, with a couple of board members just for a day. 
And it's this, uh, this management team is very much aggressively trying to spread service anytime we can do that. So as an example, um, yesterday we had, I believe, five individuals that were extra personnel based on um, vacation and this small surge that we had based on not as many retirements um, that we had projected in a very small number, but we had hi hired 42 firefighters in our last academy. It gave us the opportunity yesterday to serve Station 106 with the engine company for one day. Today it's not in service because we didn't have the extra people. But I can tell you, and I applaud the operations division, Chief Bridge and your group, um, because if we can provide as much service as possible, we're going to do that. And yesterday that was demonstrated, so thank you. Um, if we're able to do that another day or two, um, and it literally might just be another day or two because we have people every single day retiring, um, promoting, whatever they do that changes the availability of those resources, um, then that's a very dynamic situation. But um, just glad to mention it tonight. And um, the management team underneath operations is uh, definitely working very aggressively to serve the public, so thank you. And let's see, probably um, the most dangerous thing I'm gonna do this weekend will be out running to fill the boot um, in a fantastic uh, fundraiser that we do every year for the Firefighters Pacific Burn Institute. It's the annual Chiefs Challenge. I know it started, um, I believe, tomorrow. They're up, actually up in the basket. Um, they were out today. Up in, in the basket today? Yeah. Okay, so. thank you. <laughs> I'm sure the guys that are up in the basket right now are thanking me for um, tomorrow. <laughs> But I would say it's a, it's a fantastic uh, opportunity for our agency and the regional firefighters uh, in um, combination with the Burn Center, Local 522. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of firefighters um, that go through that system, but um, as importantly, the general public has a tremendous burn center in this region. And so um, anybody that has the opportunity to come out at any time to fill um, the firefighters that are in the intersection of Sunrise and Greenback, starting today on the 11th through the 14th, Valentine's Day. Um, greatly appreciated to fill the boot, and the specific Chiefs Challenge will be on Saturday, the 13th, from 9 to 11 a.m., and um, we'll be out there um, hockey checking each other so that we can get our boot to the windows first. It's very, uh, it's very entertaining, um, and Chief White from Sac City always makes that entertaining. Um, so that will conclude my report this evening. If um, there's any further questions, and otherwise I'll turn it over to Chief Bridge. Questions? Do you have your boot today? Yes. We will do that by, before the end of the meeting. Thank but you. One other question. Uh, when can we specifically target you, Chief? I, I mean, <laughs> is your target to be there? Um, I will be uh, in the intersection from 9 to 11. 9 to 11. Plus or minus 15 minutes both sides, because I'll cheat for charity. You know that. Um, <laughs> On Saturday, All Saturday right. morning, nine in the morning till eleven is the official um, time frame. Thank you. And with that, happy to turn it over to Chief Bridge. Good evening. Thank you, President Scheidegger, fellow board members. Uh, Eric Bridge, Operations Chief, will be brief. Uh, since our last uh, board meeting on January 28th, uh, Metro Fire has responded to just under 3,700 calls, of which 14 of those were structure fires and three of them were brush fires. And that's all I have for you, unless you have any questions. Questions? Thank you, Chief. Okay. Council Lover? No, no report. Thank you. Is anyone here from 522? All right. We'll pass on that. Thank you. Committee and delegate reports. Executive Committee. Uh, the Executive Committee met tonight. Uh, first of all, uh, we talked a little bit about the workshop, as I alluded to earlier, and uh, please make sure, board members, you get those dates, date options uh, to Melissa, as well as your priorities. Uh, we also then went into closed session uh, and talked about succession planning. Um, we did decide a couple of things. One, that uh, we will expand the recruitment base to internal and external scope. Um, Currently, we are working HR. Uh, Melissa is working on redoing the uh, job description for the position. Uh, and we also decided that we would, uh, through the professional services agreement, uh, hire a consultant to assist us with this process. 
Um, the consultant will meet with this body uh, in closed session uh, in the first meeting in March. So that much has pretty much been defined, and that's the path we're going down. Are there any questions from any of you at this point? Okay. Mr. Yes. I have a quick uh, yes. um, scheduling question. So our first meeting in March will be with the uh, consultant. advisor, yes. consultant. When are we planning for our re strategic. Mm, strategic meeting? Our workshop? Strategic planning workshop. Uh, at this point, we're looking at April, May-ish. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your question. Um, Communication Center, JPA, Chief Bridge. Yes, thank you. The JPA Com Center Board has not met since we last, this is our last report out to you on January 28th. Our next meeting is February 23rd, and we will have Thank you. Uh, Director Kelly is not here for the California Fire and Rescue Training, JPA. Finance Committee, Director Wood. Uh, the Finance and Audit Committee has not met since uh, I last reported out. Our next meeting is Thursday, February 25th, 5 o'clock, right here. I will be out, but Director Jones will be leading that meeting. All right. Thank you very much. Director Gould, the Policy Committee, please. Um, apparently, I missed a meeting or a memo because now apparently my name appears next to the Policy Committee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just reading what's in front of me. So Gould, congratulations to <laughs> Director Gould. Congratulations. Fine selection. You were the only oh, member on read. the committee sure. that remains from last year. Oh, sure, so, whatever. Yeah. Um, we yeah. will select I know chair. how that goes. <laughs> okay. Next time we meet. I'd Thursday, like March 10th, 5 o'clock, apparently uh, the policy committee will be getting together. I'm assuming they'll have an agenda items that uh, that director will be in charge of and uh, selections will be made. And will there actually be policies to chat about or, oh, looky <coughs> here. Yes. Is there any way that that particular director can find out who else is on that committee so mm -hmm. he can reach out to them? They're sitting right next to you, Director Mitchell and Director Rosalie. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Did All right, there you go. That's in my report. That was quite a report. And by the way, I think we reported the members at the last meeting. No. But anyway, we, we, it's all clear now. Um, let's go on to board member questions and comments. First of all, Director Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll pass for tonight. All right. Director Orzali. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I'd, uh, well, first of all, I want to congratulate Director Gould on, on his <laughs> hard-won campaign. <laughs> uh, I also want to take a moment to uh, express my appreciation to the, the fire marshal for taking the attitude of collaboration and, and setting a tone of let's accomplish the goal so that we're compliant, but we support the community. We've all experienced um, the kind of bureaucratic my way or the highway attitude that, that can easily exist. And the, the, the issue is how do you meet everyone's needs? And I appreciate the fact that we're taking that position of let's make this work. So with that, uh, that's all I have for this evening and thank you. You don't have a slideshow of your recent mm -hmm. okay. I could read or recite Thanatopsis if that would help. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Director Rosalie. Director Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just like to um, once again thank uh, Mr. Walker and Mr. Roberts for their heroism. I, don't, I think if you live in this community, you know the second part of that story, which was quite tragic um, and pretty difficult, and for them to stay there and then um, help out obviously uh, goes above and beyond. And so I, I know this happens in our community. This one was a, a bigger deal, but I'm pretty confident this goes on frequently, uh, almost every day, uh, and goes unrecognized. So thank you to the community at large for helping our men and women uh, before they get there, for helping folks that are in harm's way. So congratulations to both of those men for showing the character of Sacramento County. Well said. Director Mitchell. Thank you, Board President. I, I would ditto the feelings of the director that spoke before me in the in time element, but I also would like to say that as a new member of this board, I appreciate very much 
knowing that the guidance from Director Gould and the new policy committee chairperson will be very <laughs> helpful to me uh, as a new director. So I thank him for stepping up, as he has in the past, to take those positions and to guide, to guide a new board member and take him kind of under his wing. I appreciate it very much. <coughs> Good luck under that wing. To second the appreciation of the director. <laughs> All right, let's move right along. Uh, director Jones uh, wanted to change your mind. Right, I changed my mind. Sorry, I, I was thinking about uh, items that you had uh, just said, Mr. Chair, in terms of our strategic workshop. Uh, again, uh, reiterating uh, previous statements, congratulations to our civilians. And I am sure, al along with uh, other directors, that this happens quite frequently. Not... A lot of people step up to situations that lots of folks never know about. And so it gives me great pleasure and pride to be able to acknowledge folks who are distinguished in this area and uh, just do incredible volunteer uh, in the moment work. So congratulations to our two civilian recipients. Also, I'd like to say uh, congratulations to all three employees of the year. Good work and congratulations for having a deep bench for uh, big, uh, tough choices, tough choices. Two more items. One, good discussion regarding the appeal to the board regarding the Milagro Center. Uh, this type of dialogue and back and forth and discussion adds to our, how can I say this? It, it adds to the depth and the knowledge of everyone in the room and perhaps also can import a bit of the concern and part of the work that is not often seen from the public viewpoint. And it is critical for our work to maintain uh, community risk reduction efforts. And let's see. Also very important, very specific. Uh, kudos, Chief, staffing up when, we, when the numbers allow us to have these extra people to go to step up and staff uh, previously closed engine companies. That's critical. That's an immediate response that's looked at in the morning. It's, it's filled, it's, or perhaps it can be projected with the uh, vacations and so on. That's what we have to do. And that shows a nimbleness and an attentiveness to service from our, high, from our uh, senior management staff. Thanks, Chief. That's a good job. I'm glad you changed your mind, Director Jones. Director Barnes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A few things I want to say first and foremost, the Guns and Hoses charity football game was on January 29th. Sorry, all of you were incorrect in who was going to win on that game. <laughs> it was a great game. As we talk about the charities win, uh, we raised uh, quite a few thousand dollars. We're meeting as a charity uh, committee in the near future, talk about monies donated uh, to those uh, well-receiving charities that need them, that are starving for money right now uh, to help them operate. Fill the Boot campaign, I look forward to it. Last year I went and I remember reporting out for the first time I had taken my daughter and there was a safety fair. And as we pre-plan for fire dangers in your own house, it was amazing to me as I feel we do a lot of preparation in my own house that uh, there was some voids that needed to be revisited. And I thought she knew what was going on as far as how to call 911, not to be afraid. And it was staggering to see the void there. And so I appreciate it. I look forward to bringing her again on Saturday. And hopefully she's remembered some of that because that's going to be the challenge she has to overcome for me. <laughs> as a final, uh, as we talk, preliminary talks about selecting a new fire chief, uh, we've already tried every way possible to keep him here. Uh, <laughs> so far, it has not worked. We still have a year to do so, and we're going to work on that. But uh, it's going to be intense. We expect it to be. But also, there's no doubt this board and the collaboration of the staff, we're going to have a viable candidate. Big shoes to fill, no doubt. But I appreciate your leadership. I've said it before. I'll say it again. The things that you do and have already demonstrated in the short amount of time that I've been here, I truly appreciate that. So thank you. My final thought, Kasumna's firefighter, I hope I don't mispronounce his last name, Eric, I believe it's Oviedo, who was struck by a vehicle on the, uh, on the uh, highway rendering aid as we talk about the fire dangers of the job, but also there are other dangers that happen in the hazardous situation. So it was great to see in the media that he went home to his family and made it with some injuries, but he'll be okay in a full recovery. So on that. Thank you, Director. Uh, as Chief Quinn said, the, the score doesn't matter. Agreed. It was a good event. Short-term memory. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Director Wood. 
Yeah, I, I just want to follow up on Director Gold's comment regarding our community character and uh, uh, put it over to the chief. Thank you for looking out for these things and bringing them to our attention. It's important we recognize and interact and, and get out in the community and, re and reward the, that, recognize those efforts. Um, to that extent, I just keep challenging all the captains, all the BCs out there, when they see people that do these things and go above and beyond, uh, show those uh, actions that show the character of our community to raise that up, get that up into the upper level so that we can continue to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Director Wood. Um, again, I just want to add kudos to Mr. Walker and Roberts. And, uh, you know, these three awards uh, are fantastic. Uh, Chief, I hope you also let the other 17 people know that they were nominated and, and that we all appreciate the fine work that's performed here every day. We're, we're fortunate to have the staff. All right, with that, uh, we're going to move to closed session, and I would invite everybody in the audience, uh, unless you have a desire, to uh, have a nice evening. Thank you very much. You want, you want this back, Director Jones? Uh, I think you need that. Gold, you got a couple things in there. What? You have a couple of things. At How least is that possible? Got a lot of uh, there's at least one tag That's with your, your name acceptance on it. of the policy.